my name is Nipendra Mishra. I have been asked to say a few words about our chief guest. Normally, I shy away from any bhashan, the habit that came to us from our National Academy days. But when the event was about our speaker, very much part of this NMML family, an eminent person, personality, naturally I thought it fit to participate in this event. I know Sri Akbar very well. I am his great admirer. And therefore, I could be guilty of making understatement, not saying enough about him and not doing justice to his eminence. But still, it's a great honor for me to welcome him here in this series of lectures that we organize on behalf of Pradhan Mantri Sangrahalaya. For those respected guests, ladies, gentlemen, who may not be very familiar with Pradhan Mantri Sangrahalaya, I assume they are, it is now, the building has the library and the administrative block and the other side has got block one which was the old Nehru Museum and block two which is Pradhan Mantri Sangrahalaya where we have catalogued and we have attempted to show the contribution of all the prime ministers in the making of this great country. Uh, just as a commercial responsibility of mine, I would urge that those who have not yet visited Sangrahalaya, they are very welcome to visit, <coughs> except on Monday when it is closed. And it will be a great learning process for us from your comments from your suggestions, because we, the work is still on. Uh, we have more or less completed up to Dr. Manmohan Singh. And we are now working on the gallery up to 15th August 2022, covering Sri Narendra Modi, the present Prime Minister. You will also be very happy, and again this is part of my commercial responsibility, happy to note that tomorrow we are opening light and sound show, which is part of the Sangrahale, and the first episode is about Indian space journey, which again, there is a very significant policy contribution of our prime ministers. The second episode, which we are likely to complete by February, will be about the unsung women warriors of the independence movement. Returning to the subject, uh, 
I, will, I, I really find it not necessary to introduce Sri Akbar, but I must say a few words as part of the responsibility. He is one of the most well-recorded journalists, public intellectual, and a very distinguished writer. He has written a number of highly acclaimed books on modern and contemporary India. Apart from his well-known biography of Pandit Nehru, he has also written highly rated and well-reviewed books like India, The Seas Within, Tinderbox, The Past and Future of Pakistan, The Shade of Swords, Jihad and the Conflict Between Islam and Christianity. He has written two remarkable books in the last few years. I would imagine he must have taken advantage of the COVID holiday. The first of these is titled Gandhi's Hinduism, The Struggle Against Jinnah's Islam, which came out in 2020. The second is a very realistic book uh, you should not just be led by the title, Dolali Sahib and the Black Jamidar, Racism and Revenge in the British Raj. That explains the content of the book, which came out earlier this year. In addition, there have been four collections of his columns, reportage and essays, during his long career in journalism, he launched India's first political news magazine, Sunday in 1976. Two daily newspapers, The Telegraph in 1982 and The Asian Age in 1994. He has also been editorial director of India Today and The Sunday Guardian. I am sure I must have missed many other contributions of his in the intellectual field, and I should be pardoned for that. Particularly, I would request him on that account. The title of present lecture is Aurangzeb, the Emperor of Counter-Reformation. It is well established that by his ill-conceived policies, Aurangzeb reversed the long-standing model of religious, cultural, and political sangam practiced in India. This contributed in some measure to the fragmentation of political power in the country in the 18th century, subsequently making way for British colonial dominance of India. Sri Akbar has earlier written on the history of Islam in India, and therefore his views on this subject would be of special relevance. With this very, very short introduction, just few words about his very, very long illustrious career, I now request Sri Akbar to enlighten us on the subject. Sri Akbar. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, your remarks overwhelmed me. And uh, uh, nothing that I will say it now will feel adequate. But uh, touching on the subject before anything else of the museum, I think it should be said something that is not often said, that without Sir's leadership, chairmanship, this project would, uh, I don't think we would have even seen this project today. We might have seen it at some point in the future, of course, but not today. 
and uh, the experience of working even from a marginal space with him has just confirmed in my perception, in my mind, I'm sure I speak for Surya also in this, that how brilliantly with a calm, almost stoic mind, he must have managed the affairs of state in the most significant position in our Indian democracy. And uh, I think uh, his contribution, first because of his uh, innate modesty, and second because uh, I'm afraid uh, nobody really gives bureaucracy its due uh, for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, they is really should be recognized. Those of who us who have watched him, both inside government and then in projects, uh, know precisely how valuable he has been, not just for the government, but I dare say, and I assert, and I assert, affirm uh, how valuable he has been for our whole nation. Thank you very much, sir. And now to a subject uh, of uh, some controversy, but I hope a subject which will, if nothing else, invoke a few questions in your mind, and from there, uh, help us throw a little light on the shadows that envelop our contentious past. As battlefields go, Panipat has hogged a disproportionate share of history's headlines. Indeed, the battles of Khanwa fought on 16 March 1527 and Samugar on 29th May 1658, both near Agra, were more significant than Panipat. Babur broke the Afghan origin uh, Lodi Sultans and Panipat, but he laid the foundations of his empire only in the following year with victory over a Rajput confederacy led by Rana Sangha of Memar, whose domain extended to Malwa, in alliance with Hassan Khan Mevati and Mahmud Lodi. The remnants of the old Lodi family had joined Rana Sangha. Aurangzeb's victory at Samugar over his elder brother Dara Shiko has left such reverberations that more than three and a half centuries later, it continues to provoke political palpitations. Samugar was much more than yet another battle of succession. Samugar was a war over ideology between two Mughal princes, a decisive clash between the concept of an inclusive India and the imposition of faith supremacy. Inheritance wars in Mughal times were inevitable in a tradition where an heir had to establish his legitimacy by strength of arms. Primogeniture never worked. In an era when life was short and fraught with peril for princes, sons challenged their fathers almost as a rite of passage. Failure did not inhibit ambition. Jahangir's rebellion against Akbar in 59, 1599 fizzled out, but his father's wrath did not quite quite a bit till his deathbed. The iconic emperor was also without options. His other sons, Daniel Mirza and Murad Mirza, had died young due to excessive drinking, the former at the age of 32, the latter when he was 28. Akbar's favorite son was Daniel, actually. He was a connoisseur of Indian music and a poet in Hindi, as recorded by Jahangir in his very famous memoirs. Jahangir's son, Khusro, wanton and immature, went to war with his father when Jahangir had been in, on the throne for only about a year. His other son, Khurram, later Shah Jahan, marched against Jahangir in 1622, as almost always the imperial banner prevailed. Aurangzeb waited until an ailing Shah Jahan proclaimed Dara Shikho heir in September 1657. Bitterness, bitterness between the brothers was common knowledge. Shah Jahan sent Aurangzeb on campaigns or appointed him governor, while Dara Shiko remained mainly by his father's side. But experience of war and administration helped Aurangzeb develop into a skillful military strategist, on-field commander, and a judge of ability. The facilities of a dazzling court, on the other hand, provided Dara Shiko 
with the environment to pursue his inquiries into philosophy, religion, and social concord. When war began, Shah Jahan had become too weak to enforce his will, and Dara Shiko proved that he was not strong enough to protect his claim. Aurangzeb prepared for Samugar with wile and ability. The nobility, Muslim or Hindu, familiar with the Mughal succession syndrome, split almost evenly. According to one account, 24 Hindu nobles with a mansab of 1,000 or more were with Dara and 21 with Aurangzeb. Many powerful nobles recognized Aurangzeb's superior strategic acumen, military leadership, and administrative skills, qualities required for the management of an empire. Hard power always has its admirers. The Aurangzeb was also shrewd enough to screen his true intentions, personal or political, when discretion could gain allies. He was a good politician. <laughs> he played the game of thrones adroitly. He wooed and won his younger bro his brother, Murad Baksha's support by promising Murad the crown. This is before Samugar. Crit crucially, Aurangzeb kept command of the army to himself and allotted only the left flank to Murad Baksh at Samukar. Mirza Raja Jay Singh of Amir was among the commanders given responsibility for the final pursuit of Darashiko, who was caught in the summer of 1659, brought to Delhi in August, and sentenced to death for deviations from Islam in a trumped-up murder case. Dara's corpse was paraded through Delhi on an elephant before being buried in a vault under the dome of Himayan's tomb. Inevitably, problems arose between Aurangzeb and Murad Baksh, who began to assert his power. Aurangzeb met his brother for a quote-unquote peace dinner in a tent. Murad Baksh, who liked his wine, was arrested while intoxicated, taken to Gwalior Fort, eventually killed by two slaves on 4 December 1661, and buried on the premises. If Murad Baksh had been astute enough to prevail, history might yet have taken another course for a prince who loved the normal good things of life could hardly have become a fundamentalist or a fanatic. In his early years, Aurangzeb kept his more orthodox instincts under check. He continued traditional practices like jharoka or the practice of being weighed in gold and silver on both the solar and lunar calendars the solar calendar is important because the lunar calendar is Islamic, and solar was uh, a common calendar. Uh, for arms of equivalent money to be distributed among the poor. In 1654, he sent a letter to Rana Raj Singh of Mewad saying that, quote unquote, men of various mazahib, that is faiths, should live in the veil of peace and pass their days in prosperity, which was the traditional Mughal line and no one should meddle in the affairs of the other. He also met Hindu ascetics like Mahan Anandanath in 1661. Aurangzeb's was mission creep rather than sudden upheaval. Whatever his intentions, he could not radically change the structure of a polity that had been so successful for more than a century. The percentage of Hindu nobles at court remained the same at more or less about a fifth his favorite noble in the first five years of his reign was Raja Raghunath, who held charge of the treasury in the lines of Todarmal till his sudden death in 1673. That became one turning point. It is necessary, as we start examination of this period, to stress that while the philosophy of universal harmony may have reached its apotheosis under Akbar's sulh kul the principle of coexistence had been in practice from much earlier. Whether through conviction or through pragmatism, the early Delhi sultans recognized the necessity of a functioning syncretic policy. The principal momentum for a philosophy of harmony, however, was driven by the fact that Indian Islam was shaped by Sufis who propagated the Quranic spirit rather than the political agenda of sultans. Sultans, willingly or reluctantly, paid homage to Sufis, not the other way around. Such ulema sought compatibility in the traditions and faith of India, 
their obiter dicta was Wahda al Wajud, the unity of existence. Since every being of whatever faith had been created by God, the state could not, in theory, discriminate on the basis of religion. This did not mean equality of faith, we should be clear about it, but it did mean equality of existence. Balance and belief were the hallmarks of mainstream, not orthodox, of the mainstream Indian ulema intellectual tradition. As they pointed out, and which Shivaji later quoted, repeated, Allah is described in the Quran as Rabbul Alameen, not Rabbul Muslimin, God of the whole creation, not just God of Muslims. They quote a chapter and verse, verse 115 of Al-Baqarah, the second surah of the Quran, says, to Allah belong the east and west. Wherever you turn, there is Allah's countenance. Verse, again, uh, Al-Baqarah 256, commands coexistence. Quote, there shall be no coercion in matters of religion. Then there is La Ikra Fa'il Deen. Another verse, Lakum dinakum wa ilya deen, your faith for you, my faith for me, is famous, but is a fundamental principle. The quote unquote unlettered prophet, this is the phrases from the Quran, 7158, was a mercy to all creation, not just to Muslims. Verse 16, 125 tells the prophet to preach beautifully and argue with detractors in ways that are best and most gracious. There was no room for imposition. The principles of pluralism, coexistence, gender reform, education, and even poverty, and I think particularly poverty alleviation, are part of the Quranic message. The Quran warns those who oppress the poor. Surah 69, verse 4 mentions the Thamud people who, blinded by wealth, ignored the warnings of the Prophet Sali, and they were destroyed by thunderstorms and an earthquake. Islam promotes gender empowerment. Female infanticide, a common practice, was banned. Women got inheritance rights. The Quran condemns slander, which is a form of hate speech, in a surah appropriately titled Al-Qalam, or the pen. It's Surah 68. It has often been noted, but nobody quite understood why, that Indian Muslims have rarely joined the current international jihad of terrorists. You'll find Muslims from everywhere, but not so much from India. This is not an accident. It is evidence of the distinctive culture of Indian Islam, shaped by faith and, of, and its ancient philosophy. The Quran condemns terrorism categorically calls it, quote-unquote, fasad. Fasad is a word we use normally. It's a Quranic word. Verse 532 says, We ordained for the children of Israel that if anyone slew a person, unless it be for murder or for, fred or for spreading mischief, uh, that is ordinary crime, it would be as if he slew the whole people. Therefore, that if anyone slew a terrorist, right, uh, it would be akin to saving the whole people. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of the whole people. Islam in India owes far more to the beliefs, wisdom, and conclusive templates established by Sufis. These advocates of pluralism and consensus reminded Muslim leaders that the Prophet in Medina had a pact with all communities. <coughs> the only people, and there were Jews, there were Christians living in there. The only people, and I stress that this should be uh, remembered, the only people that the Prophet warned against were the Munafikin or the hypocrites. Surah 2, 28 says, the hypocrites deceive only themselves. <coughs> Their hearts are diseased, they create mischief in the name of peace. Alas, the community has no shortage of hypocrites still with us. However, we should never blame Islam for the sins of Muslims. For rulers, it is politically wise to rule through cooperation. Sultans might proclaim Allah as the source of victories and take titles such as warrior in the path of Allah. But as Finvar flood, 
points out in his essay, Islam, Iconoclasm, and the Early Indian Mosque, seldom is it noted, for example, that in their Indian coin issues, the Ghurid Sultans, the first of them, continued pre-existing types featuring Hindu deities such as Lakshmi and Nandi on their coins. While it by no means proves that the issue of the image was unproblematic, the minting of such coins certainly reveals a more complex and ambivalent res response to figural imagery, even religious imagery, on the part of the, on the, part of the Ghurid Sultans than one would suspect from reading contemporary chronicles. Sultans who wanted social stability did not interfere with any religious practice of Hindus. Jalaluddin Khilji, I give a very relevant example, complained about the noise made by processionists as they passed the balls of his palace each morning with drums and trumpets on their way to worship on the banks of Jamuna. But he never stopped them. He writes, I mean, in his uh, account, uh, according to Ziauddin Barani, Ziauddin Barani was actually an uh, orthodox historian, so he doesn't quite approve of uh, the Sultan being magnanimous. They do not care for our power and magnificence, he writes. State policy was prudent. The Delhi Sultans resisted continual pressure from the orthodox ulema to enforce Sharia. Iktidar Hussain Siddiqui quotes Barani to affirm that Alauddin Khilji also, who ruled between 1296 and 1316, quote, held firm to the viewpoint that kingship is separate from Sharia and religious tradition. The king managed affairs of state while the Qazis and Muftis could enforce a Muslim law on those to whom it applied. He declared, says Barani, I do not know whether such commands are permitted or not in the Sharia, but I command what I consider to be of benefit to my country and what appears to me opportune under the circumstances. I do not know what God will do to me on the date of judgment, but this is my responsibility as the head of government. Scholar, very famous, who should be better known, Professor Mujib comments, all rulers could not be as frank as Alauddin because they did not possess as much power, but no ruler could give priority to orthodoxy over reasons of state. If we consider the period of the Sultan and look for the highest common factor in the policies of kings, it would perhaps be judicious non-interference in the matters of religion. Hilji may have been pragmatic, I admit that, rather than ideological or theological, but the state had a vested interest in coexistence rather than discord. At the top his, of his priorities of governance, he lists 10, I'll just name two or three. Cheap grain, cloth, and basic necessities were more important than the imposition <coughs> of religious law. He says this very clearly. He was the only ruler of his time to defeat the Mongols. Twice he defeated them. But even that, his military success takes second place to cheap grain and cloth. Repair of mosques was eighth on the list of his achievements. <clears throat> Many Indian ulema condemned the destruction of temples. A very famous fatwa given to Sikandar Lodi, the end of the Sultan, uh, towards the end of Sultan dynasty, is very clear, quote, it is not lawful to waste ancient idol temples, and it does not rest with you to prohibit ablution in a reservoir which has been customary from ancient times, which is bathing in the... <clears throat> Ibn Battuta, traveler from Morocco, writes that Muhammad bin Tughlaq took Ganges water for drinking on his 40-day journey when he shifted the capital to Dawlatabad. Tukluk was honoring a Hindu Indian tradition. Sufis also encouraged a mutually compatible mass culture. This is a very important parallel fact. In the 14th century, uh, Bihar, one of the most famous of the saints, Bihar Sharif, uh, Sharafuddin Ahmed ibn Yahya Maneri settled a very contentious debate on whether Muslim women could wear the traditional sindur. He saw nothing wrong in pavilion and asked a very pointed question. Where was it written in the Quran that women cannot wear the sindur? And that ended the debate. 
Simultaneously, poets joined seers and saints in the development of a homogeneous mass consciousness. Amir Khosro Delvi, this uh, audience does not need any further introduction, wrote, I am an Indian Turk, and my answers are in Hindi. Professor Mujib notes, in one of his historical masnavis, the Nu Sefar, or the Nine Skies, Khusra has devoted a whole section, the Third Sky, to the description and praise of India and Indians. He likens India to paradise and shows that because of its fruit, flowers, and climate, it is better than any other country. The Indians excel in science and wisdom. They are inventors of numerals. This is a quote from Khusra. The creators of the Panchatantra, the great book of worldly wisdom that has trans been translated into Persian, Turkish, Arabic, and Dari. Their music surpasses the music of any country. Khusro played many roles, but he's chiefly remembered for his popular poetry. His Geet is still a staple of wedding music. Chhap Tilak, Sabchini, Achche Bane, Mehdi Lavande, Amma Mera Bawa Ko Bhejo, Kahe Ko Bidahi Bidesh, and others, they, these songs touch the soul of the Indian experience. Khusro's songs helped create the dialect and dialectic of harmony between Muslims who had begun to settle in India and its older inhabitants. The great 13th century mystic, Sheikh Nizabuddin Aulia, is recognized as Delhi's patron saint. As Sheikh Jesu Daraz, another great Sufi of the Chishti order, put it, reflecting Vada al Wajud, the human seed is the same for everyone. The most radical integrinist was surely Kabir Das, born in a weaver's family in 1498, who respected a Brahmin in a Brahmin's home and recited the Kalama in a Muslim home. Kabir was scathing about the alleged piety of Orthodox Muslim and Hindu priests. I'll just read it, I don't have to translate it. Nange Piran Jog Jau Hoi, Bankara Mrig. Mukti gaya koi. When I, if only wandering naked would take you to heaven, the deer in the forest would reach heaven before you. <laughs> so, mood muraye jo siddhi hoi, sar gain bheer na pahunchi koi. So, if only by shaving your head, you could get. So, Anyway, you've read enough, Kabir, for me to continue. At his death, both Hindus and Muslims claimed him as the one. Of course, this, this Doha ends with Kahe Kabir Sunore Bhai Ram Nam Bina Kin Sid Bhai. At his death, both Hindus and Muslims claimed him as the one. The Mughals adapted to Indian ways early on, as Humayun was both an astronomer and an astrologer. Indeed, every Mughal ruler had astrology in his court, including Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb also never moved without taking advice from his astrologer. Humayun would dress in the color of the planet of the day. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Wearing a yellow robe on Sundays, for that was the day of the sun, and green on Mondays, for that was associated with the moon. Uh, taking this whole dress code to uh, mass consciousness, consciousness consciousness level. Akbar famously began to wear a local lungi while flying kites from the palace roof and used very early Hindi. Akbar's genius lay in the transformation of a Mughal empire into what with good reason should be called a Mughal Rajput realm by co-opting most of the formidable Rajput families into ruling space. Most, not all. Ultimate sovereignty belonged to him and his descendants. But he realized that it is wiser to rule a multi-ethnic, multi-identity subcontinent through an alliance resting on shared privileges and philosophy. He was only 22 years old when he abolished Jizya. Just 22. The famous nine jewels of the court included Raja Birbal, Raja Man Singh, uh, Bairam Khan's son, Khan Khanum Abdul Rahim Khan. I say mention him because he was a Shia. Bairam Khan was a Shia. <clears throat> Abul Fazal, Todar Mal, you know the names. It was Raja Man Singh who rebuilt the Kashi Vishwanath temple with Akbar's permission. And this temple, as we know, was raised in 1669 on Aurangzeb's orders. 
we know about Aurangzeb, but we should also remember that Raja Man Singh rebuilt it. Raja Man Singh was not only a Farzand, Farzand the son of Emperor Akbar by acclamation, he was also a relative by marriage. Akbar's Rajput's wives could pray at temples on the palace precincts. Both Jahangir and Shah Jahan had Rajput mothers, so the bloodline had also become mixed along with military command, court culture, and social policy. Uh, Gimili Kareri, the Italian physicist, describes Aurangzeb at a public audience on 21st March 1695. Quote, he was of a low stature with a large nose, slender and stooping with age. He was old by this time. The whiteness of his round beard was more visible on his olive-covered skin. Important point, his skin had become olive with the bloodline having, uh, in, you know, uh, mixed. In one respect, Aurangzeb remained loyal to strong tradition. He consulted astrologers. Loyalty, not a distinctive Islamic ideology held the state together, explains Barbara Metcalf. Under the Mughals, a Hindu Rajput who was loyal was praised. A Muslim who was disloyal was subject to jihad. Conversion was not required to be part of the Muslim state. When Raja Man Singh was going to Bengal, he stopped at Munger for a month. And there he was advised by the local noble, Qutb Shah Daulat. He said, you know, you're rising so high in court. Why don't you become a Muslim? You'll rise even higher. Raja Man Singh answered, that the Quran forbids forced conversion. Therefore, why doesn't he tell Allah to convert his heart before he converts his faith? And after a month, he found that Allah had not converted his heart, so he remained a Hindu. It was after this that he was given the title of Mirza, Mirza Raja and Farsant, not before, and became the first Mansabdar to be raised to the rank of 7,000. So conversion had no part to play in affairs of state. Emperor Akbar initiated the inclusion of Sanskrit in court literature. The first Sanskrit work commissioned by a Mughal ruler was a pen written in 1569 by Padma Sundra, a Jain who placed, places his patron Akbar in the context of Sanskrit aesthetics. In the 1580s, the presence of Sanskrit intellectuals at court, mainly Jain monks, had increased. Shanti Chandra, a monk of the Tapa Gacha branch of Jainism, composed an encomium titled Kripa Rasaka, which expectedly praised the emperor's abolition of a Hindu tax, which is Jizya, rescuing temples and granting life to cows. Shanti Chandra in indicates that his verses were heard and understood by the emperor. He returned to Gujarat with several farmans which benefited his sect. Sanskrit religious texts like the Arthaved, Mahabharata, and Ramayana were rendered into Persian under the aegis of the translation bureau headed by Abul Fazal. We have instances of a poet like Rudra Kavi extolling Abdul Rahim Khan Khanam. The Kashmir intellectual Jagannath Pandit Raja composed the Sanskrit panegyric to Wazir Asif Khan during Shah Jahan's reign. This was the process uh, which was interrupted. Let me give you, uh, let me give you four, more examples. In the 1570s, Akbar ordered the translation of Mahabharata into Persian with Abul Fazal in charge of the Bureau of Translation. Fazal wrote the prefet to Razm Nama in 1587 uh, while Fezi was in charge of the actual translation. Akbar sent a letter to his son Murad mentioning that the Razm Nama, which is Mahabharata, had been sent for his edification and education. The original of this uh, manuscript is still in the British Library. Uh, Abdul Rahim Khan Khanam commissioned a Ramayan with 100 illustrations, 130 illustrations, which was completed between 1597 and 1605. Jahangir was still Salim when he commissioned the first Persian version of Vashist's treatise on yoga, Yoga Vashistha. Shah Jahan extended this intellectual effort into Hindi versions of Sanskrit texts in the Devanagari script. The Mughals brought Indian epics into the forefront of intellectual discourse at the court and in ruling circles. A lovely miniature in the preface to Razm Nama, produced in 1599, shows scholars arguing, at least one of them quite heatedly, about interpretations of the text. 
Interestingly, Krishna in Bhagavad Gita is variously described as either a wise teacher, an Indian Dev, or as a pre-Islamic messenger of God. This is very interesting because uh, in Islamic doctrine, uh, God has sent messengers in all languages and in innumerable numbers. Uh, the only Islamic condition is that Muhammad is the last messenger. So before him, there can be any number. Abul Fazl explains the objective of the emperor, which was to create a bridge of academic exchange over ignorance and confusion. Quote, when with his perfect perception, Akbar found that the disputes between Muslims and the, <clears throat> and the Hindus had become excessive and their rejection of each other appeared to be beyond all measure, his insightful mind decided to translate the revered books of each group into other tongues. The Holy One of the Age did this so that by the blessing of his words, both sides would abandon fault-finding and rebellion in favor of becoming seekers of Ak or the truth. And after having become what each other's virtues and faults would make commendable efforts to correct themselves. Akbar sought a sent answer to a central question. Have the different religions no common ground? His own instincts were positive. He reached out to wine communities through emotional integration and to end institutionalized injustice. As Abul Fazl writes in his famous uh, history, Akbar drank Ganges water, which he described as the water of immortality. When he was on the march, Ganga water was brought by Campbell and Bullock cart. It was a practice continued by Jahangir and Chaja. Cow slaughter was checked. The emperor reduced his own quantum of meat in his personal diet, became largely vegetarian as he grew older, and famously wondered why men should turn their stomachs into the graveyard of animals. He ordered the translation of the Vedas, Mahabharata, and so on, and he permitted Shias to offer nimas in their own fashion. If Dara Shikoh was the apotheosis of interfaith amity, then Aurangzeb became champion of a counter-reformation that had been searching for a leader since Akbar fashioned the synthesis that stabilized his rule and his empire. Dara a scholar searched for common space in Islam and Hinduism within the vast expanse of mysticism. He linked the dormant idea of monotheism in Hindu scriptures to the Islamic thesis of Tawhid, or the unity of God. A few examples will illustrate the range of Dara's intellectual quest and individual investment in uh, knowledge. His principal spiritual mentor was the ascetic Sufi saint Miyamir. Dara Shikho compiled a biography of Sufi peers and by 1657 had translated at least 50 verses of the Upanishads into Persian under the title Siri A. Akbar or The Great Secret. Within the intellectual tides of the secret, Dara sought, quote unquote, the confluence of two oceans. His seven conversations in 1653 at Lahore with Baba Lal, a Khatri Hindu yogi from Kasur, who venerated Kabir, were recorded by his Mir Munshi. Dara's Mir Munshi was Rai Chandrabhan, a Sanskrit and Persian scholar, in a work titled Nadirul Nikat. Its importance was emphasized by the commission of three famous paintings to record the event. Bikrama Jeet Hasrat, author of Dara Shiko, and an academic, <coughs> has described his, uh, this work, which ranged across asceticism, transmigration of the soul, the significance of Kashi, salvation, and the nature of creator and creation. Babalal, for instance, explained the worship of God in the form of the idol. Quote, the whole spirit of the practice is for the concentration of the mind. Those who do not possess knowledge of spirit would certainly strive for its acquisition through the medium of the form of the creation of the idol. <clears throat> In Dara's own words, the message he took from Baba Lal was, be not a sheikh, be not a saint, be not a wielder of miracles, be rather a fakir, unpretentious and sincere. A fakir, however, was not quite the role model for a prince who also wanted the throne. Dara Shikho's virtues were negated by his failings. 
As Professor Mujib says, he had many faults, most of which arose from his inability to face con difficult situations. He was weak, incompetent, irritable, unable to control others or himself. These are significant weaknesses when you are in power. However, what he represents socially is a culmination of that understanding of which Akbar laid the foundation and which led to the creation of a mixed governing class with a common code of behavior. This understanding uh, reached its highest point, of course, in Dara's translation of the uh, Upanishads. But there is a very famous, there was a point at which Shah Jahan and Dara sought a fatwa from the most famous sage of the time, Muslim sage of the time, Sheikh Muhibullah of Allahabad, and asked him what would be the status of a Hindu in a Mughal empire. And Sheikh Muhibullah's famous reply is, it is impertinent of me to give counsel, but justice requires that the welfare of the people should be the concern of the administrative officers, whether the people be believers or unbelievers, for they have been created by God, and the persons who took the lead in being merciful to both the righteous and to others, the believers and unbelievers, was the prophet of God himself. Aurangzeb naturally dismissed Dara Shikho as apostate and campaigned for support among Muslim ulema to stop a renegade, quote unquote, from inheriting the Mughal throne. Interestingly, most of the learned Sufis of his time resisted Aurangzeb's tilt towards theocracy. Professor Murjeeb narrates that when Aurangzeb sought Sheikh Burhanuddin's blessings before Samugar, arguing that he would enforce the Sharia, the sage pointedly replied that he could only pray for the welfare of the poor, not for the welfare of princes. Aurangzeb's first ordinances against multiculturalism were issued in 1659 ending the traditional celebration of Nauroz, the traditional Persian New Year, the day when the sun entered Aries. This pre-Islamic Persian tradition was part of both the Safavid and the Mughal courts. Then, step by step, Aurangzeb banned alcohol and intoxicants like bhang and appointed a muhtasib, or the chief of the Muradity police, first time that we had them, to enforce prayer and fasting, check and Interestingly, to check the length of Muslim beards. It's not the Taliban who did it first. <laughs> the bans on intoxicants proved an abysmal failure. The old nobility was reluctant to suddenly abandon a lifetime's habits merely to please an enthusiastic Puritan. Niccolo Manucci, the Venetian physician, historian, traveler, mercenary who served in his art artillery officer in Darashiko's army. I must uh, point out here that uh, those who support Aurangzeb dismiss Manucci's uh, work as he, he was picking up gossip and of course say that he was with Darashiko, so he was anti Aurangzeb. But enough scholars, you know, he's used as a source reference for other things, so why not for this? He said that uh, Aurangzeb's first minister, Jafar Khan, uh, Aurangzeb used to drink, so Aurangzeb sent a hint that, you know, as first minister, he might uh, uh, stop doing so. And Jafar Khan, being a very, I must say, a bureaucrat of some class, replied, quote, that he was an old man without strength in his hands or firmness in his feet, had little sight in his eyes. Wine, he continued, gave him sight for seeing, power for wielding the pen in the service of his majesty, and strength in his feet to run to court when his majesty called. <laughs> so, <laughs> for all his forbidding reputation, it seems that Aurangzeb laughed. Jafar Khan kept drinking till age, abetted by alcohol, took him to the great tavern in the sky. Manichi may or may not have been recycling Delhi gossip, but the fact that there was gossip is also a sign. Professor Mujib lent some academic heft to Manichi's memoirs, noting that alcohol certainly reached the women's section of the palace. What is beyond doubt is that old habits prove more powerful than prohibition. 
alcohol merely went underground in Delhi and remained overground elsewhere. The general in charge of Golconda, after Aurangzeb's uh, victory, Daoud Khan, certainly enjoyed more than a tipple even as he took bribes from the British in Madras. Delhi citizens were appalled when Aurangzeb restricted music in 1668, the 11th year of his reign. Music was an intrinsic element of popular culture, dharga practice in Kavali, and of course, court attainment in its most classical dimensions. When orders were issued to destroy musical instruments, resentment found expression in very creative forms of protest. But by 1670, the sagacious nobles like Mir Jumla, Jafar Khan, Raja Jai Singh had passed away. Mir Jumla died in March 1663. Mirza Raja Jai Singh, veteran commander of multiple campaigns, died in 1667. Jafar Khan, who we have talked of before, who, quote, represented as well as anyone before him the standards of culture and refinement that distinguished the dignitaries of the empire, passed away in 1669. The point, I'm making the point that their death seemed to lift the restraints on Aurangzeb. Sir Jatunath Sarkar describes Mir Jumla's character. No other general of that age conducted war with so much humanity and justice or kept his soldiers, privates, and captains alive and alike under such discipline. No other general could have retained to the last the confidence and even affection of his subordinates amid such appalling sufferings and dangers. The owner of 20 mounds of diamonds, viceroy of the rich province of Bengal, he shared with the meanest soldier the privations of the march and brought premature death on himself by scorning the de delights and living laborious days. After 1670, Aurangzeb ordered courtiers to stop doing namaste and restrict themselves to salam. He prevented women from going to Darga to Muslim shrines, and then stopped Jharukha. Simultaneously, the edge of partisan malevolence began to harden, particularly among those he accused of shirk, which is apostasy. Shias, who had been a pillar of the Mughal court since Bairam Khan, were targeted. Sufis, Bohras, and Shias became victims of purification drive that against those who, have deviate, who had deviated from the Sunni creed. Shias were massacred in Srinagar. In 1675, Guru Tegh Bahadur was martyred, inspiring the rise of Sikhs under Guru Gobind Singh. There was fragmentation and growing disorder on all sides. The Marathas had found a unique leader in the iconic Shivaji who intensified his campaign against Mughal rule. By the time of Shivaji's campaign in 1674, his standing army was es is estimated to have at least 10,000 cavalry and 50,000 infantry, with large swaths of territory in its thrall. Shivaji's army included Muslims. There was growing resistance against Aurangzeb's rule even in Muslim areas. In the north, in Khyber, an Afghan uprising became so dangerous that Aurangzeb had to march himself to the frontier. Shia kingdoms in the south were then targeted. Uh, Bijapur, as you know, and Golconda. This led to foreign policy problems. Safavid Persia, bastion of Shia power, took up the Shia cause. In 1666, Shah Abbas taunted Aurangzeb in a letter sent through the Mughal ambassador to his court, Tarbiyat Khan, threatening to invade India to defend the Shia doctrine. The Persian monarch sneered at Aurangzeb as a weak ruler under whom all the zamidars were in rebellion, while pointing out that Shivaji had risen from obscurity to the peak of fame. And then I quote the Persian letter, you style yourself a word conqueror, Alamgir, that would mean, while you have only conquered your father and gained composure of mind by the murder of your brothers. <clears throat> it was a public insult. In 1680, Aurangzeb passed strictures against painting because it was allegedly un-Islamic, but this ban too was impossible uh, to impose. There survives a marvelous description of an aging Aurangzeb his beard gray and head bowed with age at the siege of Golconda in 1687. Earlier portraits, like the one attributed to Hunar, done in 1660, show him sitting upright, bathed in divine light, with a sword and a veena on the carpet. This was the early emperor. However, Aurangzeb's restrictions were a severe setback, was a definite setback to the exquisite Mughal school begun by Humayun and Akbar under the guidance of two Persian masters. 
Mir Sayyid Ali and Khaja Abdul Samad, and inspired by the genius of artists like Daswant, described by Abul Fazl as the first master of his age, Basavan, Kovarthan, Ustad Mansur, Behzad, Bishandas, Manohar, these were the great Mughal uh, miniatures at the time. A closed mind can only think of dead-end options. Aurangzeb had ordered the desecration of temples in Goa in early as in 1644 while governor, but was actually a little more careful after seizing the throne in the first phase. But two decades later, his incandescent animosity towards Dara Shikoh had not waned, according to Sir Jadunath. In October 1666, Aurangzeb ordered the removal of a stone railing gifted by Dara to the Keshav Rai temple. The ruler held his hand till 1669, the same time, 1670. You can see the change. Then orders were given for the destruction of some better known temples. The now buoyant Orthodox clergy, led by Mir Murtaza, wise of Multan, tried to force Aurangzeb to destroy the shrines, dargahs, and burn the interred bones of saints as they condemned the prayers of devotees uh, as kufr. But even Aurangzeb thought that this was going too far. Aurangzeb actually visited Admir Sharif in 1680, possibly to placate public opinion. But see the ortho what happened to the Orthodox. Mir Murtada's credibility collapsed when, during a sermon, he claimed that the Prophet had declared that consumption of bhang was a crime. A Kashmiri Muslim got up and said that Mir Wai should be punished for telling lies about the Prophet since there was no bhang in Arabia during the Prophet's lifetime. The humiliated Mir retired to his home where it was said he died of shame. But the now tattered Sule Kul was finally wrecked on 2nd April 1679 when jizya was reimposed more than a century after Akbar had abolished it in 1564. There is complementary evidence of growing religiosity in his personal life. You know, one of the things that troubled Aurangzeb was that the Sharif of Makkah had never given legitimacy to his rule because political parasite is banned in Islam. It's forbidden. It is only after Shah Jahan's death, seven, eight years, that he got recognition, and Aurangzeb never forgot that. Apologists of the Counter Reformation have cited the need for revenue as the reason for jizya, but this explanation does not bear scrutiny. Akbar ordered more campaigns for Aurangzeb, but he lifted the tax. In fact, his campaigns came after he lifted Jizya. He didn't impose it. And his kingdom was not quite the empire that it had become uh, by the time of Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb. There was no reason for a fiscal crisis in the 17th century. The principal sources of state income were from Ush, land revenue, Zakat, from Muslims, and very important, rising, the duties on international trade, which, was, which had begun to flourish. India supplied almost all the cloth used on the east coast of Africa. Indian exports ranged from cotton, silk, medicines, perfumes, woodwork, precious stones, ivory handles, tortoise shells, shields, salt water, pottery, furniture, agriculture projects. Almost everything that was required for the time. The textiles of Bengal and Gujarat had an international market. There was growing trade with the West, while trade with China and Indonesia continued to flourish. However, each tax cannot be measured in mere currency. Jizya was not meant merely to enhance revenue. It was a deliberate decision to humiliate Hindus and a stab at the heart of composite India. It dismantled internal peace at immeasurable cost. The bond between Mughals and Rajputs cracked leading to a widespread, widespread rebellion in Rajputana led by the Sisodias and Rathors. And who joined this rebellion? Akbar's son, 23-year-old, Sultan Muhammad Akbar. Yeah, he was, became their putative nominee for the Mughal throne. The imperial armies, however, won again. They won the war, but they could not restore the peace. The most powerful, and I urge you all, even those who are few who are falling, legitimately falling asleep, uh, <laughs> the most powerful indictment of Aurangzeb's jizya comes from Shivaji in a letter written in 1679, which condemns Aurangzeb for destroying the human legacy of his ancestor, Akbar. 
Shivaji described Emperor Akbar as Jagat Guru, the first one to do so, in praise of his policy of universal harmony. And now I actually quote directly from the letter which is reproduced by Sir Jadunath Sarkar in Shivaji and His Times. I am quoting it at length because it deserves, deserves to be better known. Shivaji wrote, that architect of the fabric of empire, Akbar Pacha, reigned for, with full power for 52 lunar years. He adopted the ad admirable policy of universal Hami Sulakul in relation to all the various sects, such as Christians, Jews, Muslims, Dadu's followers, sky worshippers, Falakia, Malakia, heathens, Ansariya, atheists, Dahariya, Brahmins and Jain priests. The aim of his liberal heart was to cherish and protect all the people. So he became famous under the title of Jagat Guru or the world's spiritual guide. The letter continues. Next, the Emperor Nuruddin Jahangir for 20 years, 22 years, spread his gracious shade at the head of the world and its dwellers, gave his heart to his friends and his hand to his work and gained his desires. The Emperor Shah Jahan for 32 years classed his blessed shadow on the head of the world and gathered the fruit of eternal life, which is only a synonym for goodness and fair game as a result of his happy time on earth. Through the auspicious effect of his sublime disposition, <coughs> Akbar bent the glance of his august wish. Wherever Akbar bent the glance of his august wish, victory and success welcomed him on the way. In his reigns, many kingdoms and forts were conquered. The state and power of these emperors can be easily understood from the fact that under Aurangzeb that has failed, that Aurangzeb has failed and become distracted in the attempt to merely follow their political system. They too had the power of living jizya, but they did not give place to bigotry in their hearts as they considered all men high and low, created by God to be examples of the nature of diverse creeds and temperaments. Their kindness and benevolence endure on the pages of time as their memorial. And so prayer for these three souls will dwell forever in the hearts and tongues of mankind, among both great and small. Prosperity is the fruit of one's intentions. Therefore, their wealth and good fortune continue to increase as God's creatures reposed in the cradle of peace and safety under their rule. And their undertaking succeeded. Then he describes what happened, has happened under Aurangzeb. Quote, but in your majesty's reigns, many of the forts and provinces have gone out of your possession and the rest will so do so soon because there will be no slackness on my part in ruining and devastating them. Your peasants are downtrodden. The yield of every village has declined. In the place of one lakh, only 1,000 rupees. And in the place of 1,000, only 10 are collected. And that too with difficulty. When poverty and beggary have made their homes in the palaces of the emperor and princes, the conditions of the grandees and officers can easily be imagined. In this, it is a reign in which the army is in ferment. The merchants complain, the Muslims cry, the Hindus are grilled. Most men like bread at night in the day inflame their own cheeks by slapping them. How can the royal spirit permit you to add the hardship of jizya to this grievous state of things? The infamy we will quickly spread from west to east and become recorded in books of history that the emperor of Hindustan, coveting the beggar's bowl, takes jizya from Brahmins and Jain monks, yogis, sannyasis, bairagis, paupers, mendicants, ruined wretches, and the famine stricken that his valor is shown by attacks on the wallets of beggars, that he dashes down to the ground the name and honor of the Timurids. And then Shivaji makes a brilliant, very important theological point, which I've earlier mentioned briefly. Quote, may it please your majesty, if you believe that in the true divine book and word of God, he is referring to the Quran. You will find the Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of all men and not Rabbul Muslimin, the Lord of Mohammedans only. Very, verily, Islam and Hinduism are terms of contrast. They are used by the true divine painter for blending the colors and filling in the outlines of the picture of all humanity. If it be a mosque, the call to prayer is chanted in remembrance of him. 
If it be a temple, the bell is rung in yearning for him only. To show bigotry for any man's own creed and practices is equivalent to altering the words of your holy book. <clears throat> of course, there has a very strong school of thought that says that jizya was not even allowed by the Sharia, but that's a separate story. Shivaji's devastating critique was accurate and precise. The surface might suggest otherwise, but the under empire had been undermined. The crumble would quicken into a shambolic collapse within a decade of Aurangzeb's death in 1706. Aurangzeb left Delhi in 1679, never to return. Even in his lifetime, the corruption and impotence of his generals was evident to a new rising power, the British, which you referred to. When in January 1701, Aurangzeb's governor of Golconda, Daud Khan, went to Madras to demand payment of taxes, the British governor, Thomas Pitt, pacified him with a fancy ceremonial welcome, loads of liquor at dinner and bribes. In a splendid irony, host and guest drank to the health of Aurangzeb to a salute of 31 guns. The state became fragile in a climate of pseudo-religious hyperventilation wrought by the drum beaters of faith supremacy. Sarkar writes that Aurangzeb, quote, deliberately undid the beginnings of such a national and rational policy which Akbar had set afoot. The realm disappeared into the twilight of overreach, overindulgence, and divisive self-destruction. Now, some commentators have tried to screen the damage done by Aurangzeb by stressing the piety and simplicity of his personal life. His past private life was indeed exemplary. Sarkar himself, Sajadunar Sarkar, places his intellect, his love of antique books, his vast knowledge of jurisprudence, his mastery of Persian poetry. Quote, as a prince, his tact, sagacity, and humility made the highest nobles of his father's court his friends, and as emperor, he displayed the same qualities in a degree which would have been remarkable even in a subject. No wonder that his contemporaries called him a dervish, clad in imperial purple. His private life, dress, food, and recreations were all extremely simple but well-ordered. He was absolutely free from vice and even from the more innocent pleasures of the idle rich. But personal piety is no justification for political subversion of Indian amity. And this subversion opened the gates to British colonization. Mughal emperors had dealt with your ambition peremptorily. People don't really understand how many times the Europeans were defeated. Shah Jahan destroyed the Portuguese in Bengal in 1632. And they never revived. Aurangzeb's army had brought the British to the knees not once but twice. But just within 50 years of Aurangzeb's death, the British won the Battle of Plassey. And history took another turn. And the history of India swiveled once more. The rise of British power led to a remarkable reaction among Indian ulema. I would uh, urge you to hear this with care. It's very important. In 1803, the East India Company took Delhi. Shah Abdul Aziz, son of Shah Waliullah, issued an influential fatwa with the British conquest of Delhi. This declared that British India had become Darul Harb, or a house of war, which means it was now compulsory for Muslims to declare jihad. What I would like to stress, it is vitally important to note that no such fatwa declaring any part of India, Darul Harb, had ever been issued against a Hindu state. For no Hindu kingdom, Rajput or Maratha, Vijay Nagram of Travancore uh, had Muslims among the subjects. Every single kingdom had Muslims among the subjects. But no fatwa of that world. Why? Because Muslims were allowed to practice their faith. And that was enough. And as for the Sikh kingdom of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, its administration was a personification of secularism. This cultural amity and political cooperation found one more historic crescendo in the great uprising of 1857, astounding the foreign imperialists. The British 
who had stepped in the vacuum created by the disappearing Mughals and the inability of Maratha barons to create a homogeneous successor state learnt their lesson. They began to systematically erode syncretic India because they knew this was the most significant threat to their rule. The Muslim intelligentsia of the 19th century was conscious of the damage done by religious excess and of what had been lost thereby. Sir Mir Turab Ali Khan, or Salar Jung, the first famous was that. The famous prime minister of Hyderabad from 1853 to his death in 1883 told the British resident Richard Temple that while Aurangzeb might have turned into a worse despot than the British, than even the British, Mughal rule had survived because Muslim Mughals had amalgamated themselves with the people. And this is what Aurangzeb destroyed. The Aurangzeb wound, that's how I called it. The Aurangzeb wound, however, continuously scratched and de deepened by a succession of poison darts has still to heal. Through the 18th century, and particularly after 1857, the Muslim leadership, but not the Muslim masses, fell into a trap that is so often synonymous with decline and which I have called in another essay, the romance of regression. They became entranced by an imagined past and sought the comfort of British rule as a panacea to their own weaknesses. The British manipulated them to protect and project their empire as the safeguard for minorities. The more observant among you may have noticed that I haven't used the word minorities till now. <laughs> you mentioned, sir, my book, Tinderbox. The opening sent paragraph of Tinderbox asks a question. Were Indian Muslims a minority under Mughal rule? In demographic terms, they were even fewer than they are today. The obvious answer is no. They were not a minority. The reason is equally obvious. The connotations of minority and majority are not a function of numbers, but a function of power. If a community feels empowered, it does not see itself as a minority, irrespective of its democratic strength. If my may be pardoned, the Brahmins are only 2% of Indians, <laughs> which Brahman sees himself <laughs> as a minority. <laughs> The domination of European colonization internationally also played a role in the creation of a consciousness and in addition to uh, the British manipulation of numbers, which really started from 1870. That's not the subject of his essay, but I'm mentioning it. And 1870, the realization that Bengal numbers began the uh, policy that led to the creation of Muslim League, uh, separate electorates, and so on. The minority syndrome was expertly Ah, the domination. European colonization also played a role. In 1918, at the end of World War I, a startling historical coincidence occurred. Every Muslim state in the world, whether in Asia, Africa, anywhere else, came under European rule. The holy cities of Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem became subservient to colonization or neo-colonization. What is neo-colonization? Neo-colonization is the grant of independence on condition you never exercise it. If there was any exception, actually, it was Afghanistan under King Amanullah, but that is a very tenuous form of independence. The minority syndrome was expertly exploited by the British and its allies in the Muslim League to raise the cry that Islam would be in danger in free India. The next step was partition. Paradoxically, the bulk of Indian ulema recognized a very important theological point that Islam is a brotherhood, not a nationhood. Indeed, if Islam had been sufficient as a glue for political nations, why would there be 22 Arab countries? The great orator and theologian Politician Maulana Abul Kalam Azad repeatedly pointed this out in a very prescient interview given to Shoresh Kashmiri in the Lahore based Urdu magazine Chattan, published in April 46. Azad argued that the division of territory on the basis of religion, quote, 
finds no sanction in Islam or Quran. Who among the scholars of Islam has divided the dominion of God on this basis? Do they realize that if Islam had approved this principle, then it would not have permitted its followers to go to non-Muslim lands and many ancestors of the supporters of Pakistan would not have entered uh, the fold of Islam? Azad predicted that Pakistan would break up in 46. Quote, the environment of Bengal is such that it disfavors leadership from outside and rises in, he was a Calcutta man, he knew Bengal, and rises in revolt when it senses danger to its rights and interests. I feel that it will not be possible for East Pakistan to stay with West Pakistan for any considerable period of time. There is nothing common between the two regions except that they call themselves Muslims. But the fact of being Muslim has never created durable political unity anywhere in the world. The Arab world is before us. They subscribe to a common religion, common civilization, culture, and speak a common language. In fact, they acknowledge even territorial unity, in theory at least. But there is no political unity among them. Gandhiji raised fundamental questions about this idea of partition, which the proponents of partition never bothered to answer, largely because they had no answers. He described partition as a dangerous doctrine. And then now I quote Gandhiji. Why is India not one nation? Was it not one during, say, the Mughal period? Is India composed of two nations? If it is, why only two? Are not Christians a third, are Parsis a fourth? and so on. Are the Muslims of China a nation separate from other Chinese? Are the Muslims of England a different nation from other English? How are the Muslims of Punjab different from the Hindus and Sikhs? Are they not all Punjabis drinking the same water, breathing the same air, deriving sustenance from the same soil? What is there to prevent them from following their respective religious practices? Are Muslims all over the world a separate nation? Or are the Muslims of India only to be a separate nation? distinct from others? No answers. Gandhiji rejected, rejected the way of strife and proposed the law of life, which was mutual tolerance. This is the syncretic culture of unity in diversity. Born from the soul of India and nurtured by the people of India has always rejected strife for the law of life. Stripe might be the preference of vested interests. It is not in the minds and hearts of the people. If you want to see Indian monuments, please visit the Taj Mahal or the Ajanta Temple. But if you want to see India go, India, and we are all in Delhi, go before dawn to Chandni Chowk and witness something beyond description. I'm not asking you to go and see the mosque. No, I'm asking Muslims to go pray. Muslims can pray anywhere. They can pray here. They don't have to go to a mosque. But in the pre-dawn of Chandni Chowk, every morning of my India begins with the Azad, followed quickly, very soon, by the bells of the Hanuman Temple, followed by the beautiful verses of the Guru Granth Sahib and chants of the Jain Temple followed by church bells. It's happening today. This is unique. No government has ordered it. This is the music of the organic Indian spirit. This is the music of India. Thank you, sir.